global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are 30 years away. 30 years? That won't affect me. It is though we were independent of the environment. We burned fossil fuels. We've overused our renewable resources. In the belief that we could do that forever. People are complaining about the economic crisis we have right now. You haven't seen nothing yet. You know, if we continue down the suicidal pathway that we're on, uh, where we basically turn living stuff into dead stuff and call that economic growth, this will look like the good old days. Over time in Africa, especially in these fragile regions like the Sahel, when the rains fail and people don't have enough to eat, they often turn to desperate means to survive. And in the U.S. in 2030, many of the massive reservoirs fed by the Colorado River will be drying up. We talk about the Southwest moving into drought as, as a way to, to describe what's going to happen, but technically, the Southwest, it's not going to be in drought, it's going to become a desert. In San Diego? Plan to fund the construction of 40 new coal-fired power plants over the next five years. The country took the easy way out. Coal was once again touted as our so-called salvation. But the more coal we burned, the faster our planet warmed. You get the picture. We're spewing more carbon, more methane, more nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. All the bad things of climate change are coming true. And most people were just going along with their everyday lives as if nothing had changed. And until we have a crisis of some kind, I don't think we're going to be motivated to wake up and say, okay, now we have to change. Sometimes it takes a big shock to get people, you know, out of the inertia that, that, that's built into the system. We live on the blue planet. Nearly three quarters of the Earth's surface is ocean. We used to think it's big enough and deep enough to take anything we could throw at it. And for decades, that's what we thought. We simply didn't believe we could alter the ocean's chemical composition. But all that changed when scientists discovered the acidity of the ocean has increased by some 30% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Our global emissions of carbon dioxide are causing the climate to change. But CO2 pollution is also altering the very chemistry of our oceans. When carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms a carbonic acid. And even the smallest rise in the acidity of seawater could leave coral reefs, the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet, struggling to survive. So we now know the pH of the ocean, its measure of acidity and alkalinity, is going to alter rapidly this coming century. It's one of the most profound changes we humans are making to our Earth's life support system. Here we can see how our ocean has already become more acidic since 1950. Now watch as we race through to the year 2300, the progressive change in colours representing a trend towards more acidic conditions. The acidity of the ocean is in fact changing faster today than at any time in the last 300 million years. We know ocean acidification can inhibit the ability of some marine life to grow their shells and skeletons. Coral reefs like the Barrier Reef could be severely affected. By the end of this century, coral calcification rates may decline by 30 to 60 percent, and erosion of corals will outpace new growth. Coupled with rising temperatures, many coral reefs may simply be no longer sustainable. Noah's Dick Feely explains about the consequences of acidification in the Earth's past. In the geological record shows fairly clearly that in many cases, many of these species, particularly the calcifying species and the coral reef species, went extinct. And those ecosystems had to re-evolve, had to start over again and re-evolve taken anywhere from two to ten million years for that to occur.
So the race is now on to understand how ocean acidification will affect our marine ecosystems. Just in the year 2000, researchers made a startling discovery. The most abundant hard-shelled creatures in the ocean are not oysters or corals, but in fact, tiny floating plankton at the base of the food chain. Scientists found that these organisms are already being adversely affected by ocean acidification. Some, like these delicate snails, form shells. It's just one variety of pteropod, a species eaten by so many other creatures, they're called the potato chips of the sea. And that's why plankton expert Dave Mackus is so worried. If their shells dissolve, a critical part of the food web dissolves with them. Here in the Arctic, ocean chemistry is now changing faster than anywhere else on the planet. In 2010, an international team of scientists travelled to the Norwegian island of Svalbard, deep within the Arctic Circle, keen to understand what's happening. Ulf Riebersel from Germany explains about this research. At the international scientific base of Nialesund in Spitsbergen, at almost 80 degrees north, preparations are in full swing for a unique marine research project. These giant test tubes, or mesocosms, are set to be lowered into Arctic waters to study the effects of global CO2 pollution on the marine environment. What we see here on the pier are the floating devices of what we call mesocosms. Um, they're used to enclose large bodies of water with all the organisms in there and we'll use them to study ocean acidification and the effects it has on marine organisms. So we add CO2 to those water columns to reach levels which are projected to occur in 20 years, in 40 years, 60 years from now and so on. And then we we'll just observe what the enclosed community does over a period of five to six weeks. Another way to explore this problem is through nature's own laboratories. In the Mediterranean, underwater volcanoes naturally spew carbon dioxide into the surrounding seawater, lowering the pH, such as here near Vesuvius in Italy. Marine ecologist Jason Hall Spencer has been studying the ocean just off the Ischian coast, and what he's discovered may be a microcosm of the future sea. Thanks to Vesuvius, this small patch of ocean is saturated with carbon dioxide. It's pretty amazing to look at actually because there's a, a load of bubbles bubbling up from the seabed that are carbon dioxide. And the, the reason that's happening is that chalk is being boiled by the volcano of Vesuvius, the famous volcano. It's driving this chalk up and it's coming up at normal temperature but it's acidifying the water around it, just like we're doing to the planet worldwide with increasing CO2. And this is a way of looking into the future of the planet's ecosystems because naturally this area has been acidified for millennia. Mussels, clams and oysters are clearly big business and the shellfish industry is getting worried. The Pacific Northwest is the economic front line of ocean acidification where natural phenomena combine with man-made ocean acidification to create corrosive conditions for oysters. Bill Dewey from Taylor's Shellfish Farms explains. In 2008, our oyster production here was off 60%, and in 2009 it was off 80%. And then one of the other hatcheries, the Whiskey Creek Hatchery, it's not Taylor's, but another hatchery on the Oregon coast, their production has been off 75-80%. So with two of the major facilities off that much, it's had a dramatic impact on the industry as well as failures of our natural sets in areas where oystermen rely on catching the natural seed out in the bay. Those sets have failed now for six years. So collectively, all of those problems have led to about a 20% decline in our oyster production here over the last five years on the west coast so you know it's roughly a uh, hundred million dollar industry a year so it's having a, a big impact it's an important part of our rural economy here in in western washington 
Events in the northwest are concerning. Will other areas follow? Will fisheries worldwide need to monitor ocean acidification levels? These questions need urgent answers. Already it seems clear some species and some important coral reefs are under threat. Experiments show others may adapt and some may thrive in these new conditions. There's still much uncertainty. But we already know enough to show that ocean acidification is a challenge to present and future generations. Changing course towards a better future for the ocean and for all of us can only be achieved, though, by reducing our carbon dioxide emissions.